Get started. Welcome to the Hitchhiker's Guide to Drupal 10 Migration for non-developers. Um, there are plenty of sessions for developers. This one is actually going to discuss where the bulk of the work in migration planning is, and that's for the people who actually own the site. So get you stirred up a bit. Uh, a couple announcements. Uh, please remember to use these hashtags uh, if you're going to be posting on social media. And if you haven't yet, join the GovDrupal Slack. Um, there's a couple channels in there, particularly GovCon 2023, where up-to-date announcements are made. All right, so some about me. Uh, my name is Jeff Greenberg. I work for iFactory. Um, I've been doing Drupal since 2007. Um, my software development career started the same year Microsoft did. As a matter of fact, I was out bowling with my girlfriend when Paul Allen called. He asked me to be his partner and I missed the call and he called Bill Gates instead. <laughs> um, but it's okay because I'm not a Windows fan anyway. Uh, I'm an author, Drupal author and a columnist. You might have read one of my books under the pen name J.I. in green which is also my Drupal handle. I'm somewhat of an adventurer, and I'm telling you that for a reason. Um, here you can see a picture of me when I was uh, show jumping horses, and you'll notice a sleeve hanging down. That's because I had a dislocated shoulder. Uh, the moose decided to join me on a half marathon run when I was in Alaska. I waited till he was beyond before I reached for my camera because they're very touchy. Uh, and then if you look really closely in that big photo, you see those two little dots in the water. Uh, one of them is me going through the rapids without the raft, and the other is my wife, who I managed to knock over with me. <laughs> my point is here that um, I'm an adventurer, not particularly good one, but I, I heal fast. And that adventurous spirit is what got me interested in migration. Because uh, migration, certainly with Drupal, has been a frontier. Um, especially going from six to seven, which is probably the worst it's ever been. Um, seven to nine, to me, is a breeze compared to that also. I'm sure you've heard horror stories, um, but don't worry. I think everybody pretty much has it in hand now. So let me ask about you. Uh, how many of you are not developers? Oh, great. So this is perfect. Um, and for those of you who are, uh, this could be helpful as well because I'm going to discuss a lot of the things that clients don't necessarily think of uh, when they're asking for migration. And so that might be helpful for discussion. So. I'm going to be covering two main topics. One is content. Um, what is it really? And what is it not? Uh, what are content types? And how does Drupal store content? I'm only going to be touching this at a high level, not at a deep technical level. And the reason is this will lead into the discussion, which is more important, which is the migration discussion. What is a migration? I'm going to give you some examples, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and then what is a migration really? And uh, then discuss planning. So, January 5th, 2025, you might have seen that date. Uh, this is the date now etched in stone um, that's for the end of life of Drupal 7. Uh, I had a, uh, when I was in college, I went for computer science. They made you take calculus back then for computer science. I'm still waiting for some reason to need to know calculus. <laughs> uh, but I had calculus during the summer, eight o'clock in the morning, once a week, so it was a three hour class, third floor, no air conditioning. And there's a room full of us sitting there and the professor spent at least a minute 
writing this really long equation out on the board, and then turned around and said, okay, what's next? And we were all like, huh. and uh, he slammed his book and said, read the chapter again and went out. I think if you wanted to get the same reaction, it would be if you were at the point where you had your new site already thought about, because Drupal 7 to 10, obviously you're going to have a new site. Um, and you have your colors, and you have your layout, and your call to action buttons, and what your menus are going to look like. And then you turn to somebody and say, what about the content? Because it tends to be the last thing that's really considered. What are we going to do with the content from the site we're coming from and the site we're going to? So uh, I'm going to tell you what you should say to them, and that's going to be, I think what we need to do is, and that's what I'm hoping to show you in this session, what you need to do. But you do need a plan, and we're going to be talking uh, about that towards the end. Um, I like, you'll see throughout this, I love using analogies. So my analogy for the plan is, it's not really hard getting here from Reagan on the Metro, but if I dropped you off at the Metro at Reagan and took all the maps away and said, see you in Bethesda, it'd be a whole different story. It's the same thing with migration. There are tons of people on the Drupal side that know how to get you through migration in terms of the technical part. But in terms of them doing their job, they need the client to do their job. Um, another analogy would be helping your friend move to a new house. Not a big deal. But you do hope that the boxes are packed when you head over to the old house. And it would be really helpful if the boxes were labeled with the name of the room they're going into, not the one they're coming out of when they pick up the boxes. Well, it's the same thing with migration planning. It's easy for them to do the migration if they know what they're migrating and where it's going. And we're gonna be talking about that. I should also mention that today is a special day. Today's the day Drupal 9 reached its end of life. And as a parting gift, there was a security announcement <laughs> this afternoon, um, probably the last one. You're actually more fortunate. If you're coming off Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, I think you're more fortunate. Uh, there may have been the expense of having a new site designed, but it's like getting a new house, okay? You're not retrofitting or renovating a house while you're living in it. You're moving into a new house. The folks that are on Drupal 9, I know it's been said that going to Drupal 10 is supposed to be like updating your iPhone. Mm, they're not quite there yet. Um, it, it's pretty, can be pretty difficult, so you're in good shape. But there is a chance, if things aren't done right, that it would also be the end of life for your website. And that's what we don't want to happen. So I'm, I'm hoping to help you beyond that. So let's talk about content. What is content? I actually asked somebody, what are the, because I've struggled over, when we talk about content in the context of Drupal overall or a content management system, it's not always in the same context that you're using the word. And I've asked people what they think content is. So, I came up with a, a question which is, what are the contents of a book? And the answer I get would be something like, oh, the cover, the title page, half title page, so forth and so on. And then I would ask, well, why isn't anything you mentioned in the table of contents? Because the table of contents is supposed to tell you what the contents of the book is, right? But none of that's mentioned in it. And that's when the heads explode. All right, so I wasn't, I actually asked a few people this. I wasn't getting any closer because I was really looking for a definition I could use that would make sense. So I decided I was going to ask ChatGPT. <laughs> Chat G 
ChatGPT sat there for 20 minutes <laughs> thinking about it and never gave me an answer. Okay. So I decided I was going to come up with a, a very deeply technical, contextual definition of what content is. <laughs> and that's what content is. It's stuff. If I'm looking at a home page, I might say everything on this page is the content of the page. And, and that would be fair. But when we're talking about migration, that's not the content we're talking about typically. Um, normally, we would look at the header and the menu up top if there is one and say, this is navigation item, this is branding, this isn't really content, this isn't what people are coming to read. So let's get rid of that. And if we're looking at the bottom of the screen, the footer that's usually a bunch of links might be helpful to them but that's not really content either. That's not what they're coming to read, to absorb. So let's kill that too. And what we have left then is what I would think of as content on the home page. On interior pages, it would probably just be a, a single thing. Um, but here, for example, uh, we're looking at the content. And I would say these are what we would call teasers, right? It's not really the full article or full, full news uh, item, but they're teasing you into clicking through to read it. And I would call what they're pointing to as a piece of content. So if you hear me use the term piece while going through this, like a, a newspaper person would or something, that's what I'm talking about. Content in the context of what we would want to migrate to the new site. Um, so let's take a look at what this home page has in the way of content. This is where content types come in. What Drupal allows you to do is segregate different types of content into what they're used for. So for example, if I have um, an event, the information I would need to present an event to you it's completely different from the information I would need to present a news piece to you. So Drupal stores them differently. That way I don't have to worry about all the time trying to say, well, this is what we need to look at in the event. Um, when I create the event, it's going to have the date and the time. We don't really care about a date and time. Well, maybe a date, but not a time on the news item, on the news item that type of thing. So this page we're looking at, um, it'll have uh, uh, news items, it'll have articles, it'll have announcements. Each of those could very well be their own content type. And the reason content types are important is because when we migrate things from the old site to the new site, first of all, the content type needs to exist because Content types on their own don't migrate. We sort of create them. I mean, from Drupal 9 to 10, it's not a problem, but from Drupal 7, we pre-create the content type on Drupal 10, and then we bring the content over into it. So we need to know what the content types are. Um, there's a much more important reason, but that's gonna be more into the planning thing. I'll just say for now, don't assume that everything stays the same, because the fact that it doesn't is where we're going to see the need for planning. All right, let's look at one particular content type, and this is the news one. So on the left, this is from the DrupalCon uh, site, you'll see a piece of news, um, and it's got the, uh, the title, the subtitle, it's got a graphic, it's got the body text, it's got a um, tag at the bottom. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side, this is what a content creator sees when they're creating the news piece. And it's segregated into fields. And, and why is that? Well, one reason is that if we were trying to, on a particular page, give a list of news titles, 
if all we had was a big blob of body text that made up our, our news item, how would Drupal know what's the title? Or how would Drupal know what the subtitle is? So one of the reasons that we segregate things into fields is to make it easier when we're searching and make it easier when we're presenting. Uh, but that's not the end of the story because what you see in these fields here isn't necessarily what's stored in the database for that field. So let me go to the next slide here. We've got the, the title that pretty much looks the same. Subtitle, body, and the, uh, the tag. But here's what really is there. Now, the, the title text and subtitle, they're just plain text. There's no difference between what you see when you're entering it and what Drupal stores. But the body text is formatted, right? It gives you a WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Like, it's like in Microsoft Word with a little toolbar. It stores that as HTML because the HTML actually is what describes what it should look like when it puts it out on the page for the user to view. So even though the content creator is seeing text, that's not quite what it's storing. Even more so are the image and the tag. There's what are called reference fields. So in this news article, we're not actually storing the value of the tag, the word that you see. And we're not actually storing the image. I mean, if we had 50 news items using the same image, we wouldn't want to store 50 copies of it. What we store is an ID number. The ID number of the image, the ID number of the tag, and it points somewhere else to where those things are kept. So why is this important? Because one of the things that has to be considered when you're bringing stuff over to the new site is that if you don't migrate in such a way that the ID numbers stay the same, what happens is you're going to end up with content pointing to all the wrong stuff. Who knows what image is going to be pointing at and who knows what tag it's going to be pointing at. Either you have to make sure you got the same ID numbers on the receiving end or when you're migrating and issuing new ID numbers, you have to change that little reference number back in the piece of content to match. So, and it's not something you need to worry about. Um, it's something that's part of the migration, but again, it's something that needs to be planned for. Um, these things all that I've talked about are going to feed into uh, the planning part of the migration, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So, as it turns out, none of the official definitions of migration apply in our context either. What is migration? If you look up the definition, it's a mass movement from one place to another. Um, they might say that give you more information about the types of mass migration, be it seasonal or that type of thing. So this is the kind of migration um, that we have seen on uh, Nacio. Um, salmon returning to spawn. That's a once in a lifetime migration, right? Because after they spawn, they die. Baby boomers moving to Florida. That's a once in a lifetime migration. Migrating from Drupal 7 to 10 is a once in a lifetime migration. Um, so that, that's why I'm mentioning it. And happily for everyone, um, going from 7 to 10 is, isn't going to be as difficult as getting past the crocodile, I would think. But there can be perils, um, you know, not, not necessarily hyenas or dust storms, but we'll be talking about it a little bit. Um, let's look at some migration examples, but first let's talk about what is it really in our context. I look at migration as three umbrella phases. Um, first we need to gather. So the gathering is 
on the Drupal 7 side. We need to look at what do we have here and what are we going to be bringing with us and what are we going to do with what we're bringing with us. And I'm not going to leave it at that. I'm going to give you more pointed example about that. But that's what tends to happen in the gathering stage. We're defining our source. The last phase, phase three, is the delivery phase. That's the Drupal 10 side. All right, so what are we going to be doing when we get there with what we brought over? In the middle is a part that I'm not going to be talking about um, during the session, which is the transport part. That's the actual stuff that the developers or whoever is going to do um, where it's exported from the existing site, be it database to database, or CSV, or XML, or JSON, um, and brought over to the new site. So that's not really going to concern us. On the gathering side, though, we do have some things we want to, to look at. So what content should be taken to the new site? You don't necessarily want to bring everything. Um, particularly, you know, Drupal 7 has been around a long time, a um, decade or more, right? Um, there's a lot of cruft that can gather during that time. You know, it's like your attic. You might not want to bring everything, particularly if you have, you know, 100,000 pages of stuff. Um, if you have news items that are 15 years old, that type of thing. So looking at each content type, um, are the pieces of any going to be rewritten? It might be that things aren't up to date, things you have a new editor, they want to present it in a different way, just want to clean up a bit. If that's the case, it may not be worth bringing it over automatically. You might want to re-rewrite, or not rewrite, you might want to rewrite that content um, instead of migrating it. So, there's also the consideration of non-content items needing to be recreated. As if content weren't enough, you have to be concerned about non-content items. And, and these are important. Um, some of them you can't even bring the content over unless you bring them first. So um, I have examples here. Um, views and web forms do not migrate. Web forms, you know, when you fill out like a contact form, if you're using web forms for that, you want to recreate those. What is a view? So if you go to using an event page again as an example and you have filters and you can filter by tag or filter by date, what happens when you click the filter is that Drupal then sends a request to the view that says, here's the tag, here's the date, Give me a list of the events that match. So that the thing called the view is doing that query against the database and returning the information. Unfortunately, the difference between views in Drupal 7 and Drupal 10 is so enormous that it's almost, aside from the fact that they do the same thing and have the same name, there's nothing else really in common about the way they're architected it would have been just far too complicated, if at all possible, to create a migration path for that. So they get recreated too. Well, why is that important? I had one client who hadn't really looked at the list of web forms or views in their site until the subject of migration came up. They had 74 web forms and over 50 views. Now it was time really to consider, do you really want all those recreated? Do you use all of them? And particularly like the web forms that had a year on, like you know, this convention 2016, probably not. Um, the files have to move over. By files, I mean PDFs, um, images, that kind of thing. They need to come over first or second. And the reason is that you probably have content pointing to them. Your content can't point to them unless they're actually there. So we tend to bring those over before we bring the content. Um, redirects, URL aliases, you know, you get those pretty URLs when somebody goes to the page. It doesn't say 
um, mysite.com slash node slash 1652, it probably says mysite.com slash important news article. Well, that important news article is actually an alias. It really is node 1652. So that list of aliases, assuming you want to keep the same ones, and you probably do since people have them bookmarked, um, you're going to bring over. Uh, custom code modules. That's something you don't consider either. Some sites don't have any custom code. Some sites have a ton of custom modules. Custom modules that were written for Drupal 7, if you're still using, will need to be rewritten for Drupal 10 to some degree or a great degree, depending. Fair warning, if content can take longer if you have a lot of it than the actual site and migration part of it. It all depends on how many modules you have. The custom theme as well. Themes from Drupal 7 will not run on Drupal 10. Drupal 7 used PHP template um, for the logic for your theme. Um, Drupal 10 uses a thing called Twig, um, so that has to be redone as well. And user roles. Uh, so when you create a piece of content, an author is assigned. Whoever the user is that's creating it, you can change it afterwards, but whoever happens to be logged in and is creating that piece of content, their user ID gets associated with it as the author. Same thing, when you migrate the content over, one of the fields it's looking to plug in is the user. If the content was on Drupal 7 with user 600, and you come to Drupal 10 and there is no user 600 or any users at all, then the only thing that can really be done is to assign them all typically to a non-existent user by default. And then you'd have to change them later if it really meant something to you. So it's easier to bring the users over first. And that means their roles as well. So those are the non-content items. Another thing to keep in mind are the images. So the images don't change as such for Drupal 10. Your theme might use a different size, but um, the, the thing on Drupal 7 is that there's a thing called media, which is confusing, it's the same as content, the word content. Um, media in the context of Drupal 10 is a wrapper that goes around the image or the PDF or the video. The reason for that is first of all, so you can look at them in the library when you're wanting to add one to content. Uh, the other reason is on Drupal 7, you uploaded an image, you put it in a piece of content, you wanted that image in another piece of content, you uploaded a second copy, you put it in the content. Media is reusable, so you never need more than one copy uh, on there. But it has to be converted to media when it comes over. So the thing you have to consider as part of that is, do you want the images? Um, I had one client who they were going to bring in a photographer because the images were so outdated because the Drupal 7 site was so old. They decided they would shoot all new stuff. Um, so you know it could be one end of the spectrum or the other or anything in between. So it's good to decide what you're bringing with you. All right, so in terms of planning, um, this is called a content inventory. Uh, I, I put a tiny one up in the, on the top left because it's, it's just so wide a spreadsheet. Um, I didn't want to bog you down with it. Um, but the, the one on the right gives you a better idea. On, on the bottom left, it's really a count. How many of each type of content do we have? This is the type of planning that should be done by the site owner and their team. And the reason I'm saying that is that the, um, the website development folks or the developers or anybody on the team that's going to be doing the work for you they could do it too, but it's the timing, and I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that. It's something that should be done 
at the inventory level before they get involved. And the whole idea of an inventory and the easiest way to go about it is your site map. You go through your site map here and you list it out. This is all the pages that you can get to from the home page. Okay? And then in the next column, do we want to bring it? Do we want to leave it? Maybe you want to put, if we bring it, do we want it as is or does it need to be rewritten? You don't have to do that right now in terms of making that particular decision, but it's a good idea to get your content inventoried so you know what you're going to be bringing over. Um, there are ways to generate a list of, of um, content if you have, you know, if you're up in the hundreds or the thousands, you probably want to do it manually. So you probably want to import it, you know, generate a list and then import it into a spreadsheet make it easier. So let's look at a couple migrations, um, the types of migrations, and then we can talk more about why it's important to plan. So I'm going to start with the good, which is a simple migration. And this is about as easy as they come, because we have identical content types. We have identical fields in the content type. And our content is identical. With meaning that we're not changing anything. Whatever it said on Drupal 7, it's going to say on Drupal 10. That's about as easy as it gets. The analogy I would use for this is here. We've got a field full of cows. We want to move the cows from that field to the other field. No big deal, right? It's not totally without risk, knowing cows, but certainly it's not fraught with peril. That's the same thing with a simple migration. A lot of migrations, though, aren't quite that straightforward, especially, again, because of how old Drupal 7 is. It's more likely than not that you are going to look at your content types and say, God, you know, we don't need this one anymore. These two should be merged into one. This one should be split into two. This has, look look at news. Like, we're taking news from outside now. We need to have the, the writer's name. We need to have a link to their bio or to their site. You know, all that kind of stuff. So we need new fields on the content type. So things will change. And as soon as you start making those kinds of changes, then the migration gets more complex. So in this example, we have news items. And based on the value of certain fields within a news item, when we get to the 10 side, we're going to decide it might stay a news item, or it's going to go into a new content type called special interest, or it might even be going to a microsite, a second website, a child site on our Drupal 10 side. It's not even going to be in the same website anymore, but we need that content to put into the second one. This is a complex migration. It doesn't have to be quite this complex. Just changing things around make it more complex because now you have to build code in in some cases, um, in order to, to accomplish these things. You're not just saying, pick it up and drop it, pick it up and drop it. And I ought to point out, by the way, um, I hear a lot of people quote page counts when they're talking about migrating. If you're rewriting stuff, page counts mean a lot. Because you know, you're paying, unless you're doing it in-house, or even if you are, um, it's costing you per page to rewrite stuff. But if it's going to be automated, if it's a Drupal automated migration, you write a script, let's say, to move the news items. Once that script is written, it doesn't care whether you have one news item or 10,000. Okay, So just keep that in mind, that the page count typically does not matter when you're doing that kind of migration. So with a complex migration, my analogy <coughs> is uh, the, the cows again, except now 
you know, they're becoming two cows, two pigs, and a horse in another pasture, which makes it much more complicated. So uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was a content planner. And this is, this goes a little further. This is the content you're going to have on the Drupal 10 site that you're bringing over from Drupal 7. Um, and if you're going to have a new URL, you can put the URL, that type of thing. Um, this isn't done at the same time typically as the inventory, uh, but it is important. So if you have a complex migration without that planning, you're hoping, you're, you're looking at it as, I'm, I'm wanting these wildebeest to jump this crocodile and land in the field and everybody's gonna be happy. We're not planning, we're just hoping for the best. Typically what you end up with is a fat crocodile and happy um, after that, and that's not what you want. So the planning phase um, is something that's really important. And we, we talked about you know, the reasons for that in here. The thing to keep in mind is in terms of timing, there's three legs of a project typically. The time available or the time you want it done. The scope and resources. That's people, money. Um, the resources that can be brought to bear um, Keep in mind that throwing more people at the project, if you're not getting, if it looks like you're not gonna make the time, doesn't usually make a difference. There's an old saying that uh, nine women in a month do not make a baby. So it, it's the same thing with the project, that you just can't throw people at it and expect things to be resolved. Uh, you may not have the budget either. Um, so in order to keep the things in balance, to keep the three legs of the stool in balance, it's best to do as much planning as possible. And that way uh, you'll have the things that you need during the course of it. Uh, because otherwise, without the planning, people have to go hunt for the information I've been talking about and be sidetracked and everything. I don't know if uh, this might be dated, but there used to be a comic strip in the Sunday paper, Family Circle, or Family Circus. Um, and it usually was like this, where they told the child to do something, and by the time <laughs> they got done doing it, and being distracted on their way there, it was way too late. That's not what you want to happen with your migration. So the last thing I'm going to talk about um, is when do developers need the information about what's going to be gathered or what was gathered and what's going to be delivered. Typically, what I've seen in terms of timing is it happens about here. An RFP comes out, it says, we want this, we want the site to have, you know, be accessible and to have personas and this and that, and oh yeah, and we want my content migration, and that's all it says. And then the discussion of content migration doesn't happen until way into the project. That's bad news. That's going to get you the, the chubby alligator. Um, the really the best time for this to start is here, before you write the RFP. Even if you don't have the time necessarily to do the inventory, wrapping your brain around this is what we have, not at a page by page level, but this is what we have and this is what we expect to have on the new site, that's a great start because you can put that in the RFP. We're gonna have two sites. We're gonna have content types that we need merged and split. You know, whatever you know in advance, and a good reason for that is to get apples to apples <coughs> bids. If all you say is I want content migration, what are people basing their bid on, right? So, I want to leave you with one thought. Um, I told, told you I was an adventurer. So I ran, I'm a runner, and I know what you're thinking, um, but I really am. <laughs> <laughs> and two years ago, I ran my first and last full marathon, 
Um, well, thank you. What was your time? Six and a half hours. <laughs> some, some guy just ran Chicago in two hours and three minutes. <laughs> Mine was six and a half hours. But um, it, it, it's, it's, it's cruelness, cruelty to your body, um, at least in my case. Um, and on my 18 mile training run, I didn't fuel enough and I passed out while I was running face first into the concrete. Um, it, it, and, when, and when you get to mile 23, your body starts shutting down and uh, I remember that too. Um, but I made it, I look back at it now and I still can't believe it. I drive somewhere and I see something's 25 miles away and I'm looking as I'm driving, I think I can't believe. You know, I'm still going 15 miles, 20 miles, I can't believe I ran that. And my message is that we are all capable of doing wondrous things. If you've got the stamina, if you've got the interest, if you've got the focus, and you really want to succeed, you will. Migrations really are not that difficult if you're willing to put in the time to do the thought and the planning for it. You will be successful. So with that, any questions? Yes. Will your slides be available there? Yes, they will be. Uh, they're putting the slides and my voice up on YouTube at some point. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I have a question. You mentioned something about um, for gosh, what was it? The content inventory at the mm -hmm. beginning, and I think did you say you have the compliance to that intention? Not necessarily the content strategy. Maybe I heard it wrong. Oh, so the the inventory is something to gauge what you have on Drupal Seven. Okay, I, was, I guess it was the, the site the planner. map. Maybe look at the site map. Um, oh yeah, so the the inventory is based on the site map, yeah. right? And did you say to have the clients help with that, or? So I'm saying that the client actually should do the inventory. Okay. Yeah, the client before the. What, in like the optimal what, what world. They, the keeper archive. Yeah, in oh. optimal world. Okay. Yeah. The client should do that before generating the RFP. Because if you've got 100,000 pages and then you do the inventory and you're only bringing five, right. that's a big difference in the cost. Can I get that recorded? <laughs> yeah, right. I understand. Yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. So, what, what is the end of life for Drupal 7 and Drupal 9? Because it seems like Drupal 7's end of life is later. Drupal 7 is two years from now. What about Drupal 9? Today. <laughs> so why, why is that a okay. later version, earlier? Sure, fair question. Um, there's one huge difference between Drupal 7 and Drupal 10. Drupal 8, 9, and 10, the architecture changed, and they're built on top of this platform called Symfony. And a lot of the services that are delivered to Drupal are done by Symfony. Drupal 7, no. Drupal 7 was standalone and it had to provide everything itself. So the reason is that going from Drupal 8 to 9, very little change. I know that there was some hiccups doing the upgrade, but that was like module versions and stuff. Drupal 9 to 10, same thing. The, the update is in place. You don't have to migrate content. You don't have to move to a new site. You don't have to change your theme. The only thing you have to do um, is upgrade the version. So in that sense, it's like an iPhone, iOS upgrade. It has its hiccups. It, you're still working through some of them, but that's what it is. Drupal 7, it's almost a rewrite. So that's why more time. And because there's like 30,000 sites still on Drupal 7. Can I just add one thing to that? A good way to think about it too is like the code bases have diverged, so you can almost think of them as two different products. And part of the reason, the primary reason why Drupal 9 is end of life today is because of Symfony. But the reason why they can end of life it at all right now is because there is a supported version of 10.0, 10.1, and about to be 10.2. So those are the supported versions of modern for Drupal 7, there's not going to be any more versions. It's just in security support. And that's why, for that and other reasons, the end of life has been extended longer to give people more time, but why there's 
you know, not another version. And, and that's a, he applied a good point too. I said it was built on Symphony. Symphony is really driving today because the version of Symphony that Drupal 9 is on, its end of life is today. So we have to have a new version of Symphony as well. So what's the urgency to, to upgrade to 10 before on 9 right now? Like right now because it once it hits end of life, there will be no more security releases for it. So if if it security urgent? bugs are found in Drupal 9, they're not going to be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Except for Symphony. Except for Symphony. Yeah. Yes. So let's suppose you have 300 clients, and um, so that means if the site owners, 300 site owners, are responsible for running the inventory, what about moving all the content over to Drupal 10 and then having the inventory catalog rather than the old site? So you can do that. The, the cost of that is that the Migration has to be set up to move the content types as they are. Uh -huh. if, it, if it ends up where it won't change, then you're in pretty good shape. But if it turns out, A, that the content types don't really meet the requirement anymore, either because you need new ones or splitting or merging, or if it turns out that a lot of the pages have to be rewritten, um, or maybe all of them for one content type have to be rewritten, then you've migrated them for nothing. So it's, I mean, it could go either way. It's something definitely worth giving thought to before you do that. Yes? Um, I was wondering, I saw that the CK editor is being updated in the newest version of Drupal. Mm -hmm. Are there any considerations that you have to make when yeah. you're migrating your you know, body copy description. No, but here's the consideration that needs to be made. So CK Editor 5 is Drupal 10, CK Editor 4 is Drupal 9. However, CK Editor 4 exists for Drupal 10 as a contributed module now, instead of being inside Drupal and core. So if you have to use CK Editor 4 for the time being, you can. You just have it added to the site as the contributed module version. And the reason you would want to do that is not because of the body, but because some people use specific add-on plugins for CK Editor. Not all of them are available yet for CK Editor 5. So if there's any that are important to you that are not, you might want to stay on CK Editor 4 for now. But the, the actual uh, HTML code or That's the same. Would work regardless. Yeah. It'll work. It's a little different the way CK Editor 5 writes HTML, but it's not going to affect you. I have a, have a question uh, about uh, upgrading from 9.6 to, uh, to 10. Um, so when, when the upgrade from 8.9, uh, when we went from 8.9 to uh, 9, that went pretty smooth. I think there would, might have been a couple little composer depend, uh, dependency issues, but I'm noticing that the, the upgrade from nine to six to 10, there seems to be a lot of composer um, dependency issues. And I was wondering uh, how come eight, version eight went from you know, eight, 8 8.5, six, 8.7, 8.9, and then went to, to nine, but 9.6 doesn't seem like it's gonna go to 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, to fill in that gap? Is it just going to go from 9.6 to and jump to 10? 9's done. Yeah. No more releases for 9. Okay. The reason you're having dependency issues could have something to do with the new version of Symphony. It could have something to do with um, the way it's handling dependencies. When you get back, look at, um, it, I can't remember, if it's, I think it's leniency. There's a uh, composer when you run Composer, you can use a switch to tell it to be lenient when it looks at the, the dependencies. Okay. And uh, I've seen that help in a lot of cases. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. And if you have any more questions, there's my contact information. And I really appreciate it.